In his 1950 article, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, British mathematician Alan Turing described the rules of what is now famously known as the Turing Test, a hypothetical game used to judge the success of artificial intelligence and answering the question once and for all, can machines think? The Turing Test goes like this. Imagine that you're in a room chatting on a computer with two unknown entities, one of which is an actual person and the other of which is a computer AI, or what today we might call a chatbot. You can say anything you want to each of your two interlocutors to try to figure out who is who, but in response, they're going to say everything they can to convince you that they're the real human being. All the chatbot has to do to pass the Turing test and thus be deemed intelligent is to fool you. That's it. Instead of holding artificial intelligence to some measurable standard of human personhood, Turing thought that all a computer needed to successfully be intelligent was to successfully perform intelligence. By extension, for Turing, seeming like a thinking person simply is being a thinking person, or at least the functional equivalent of one. But this isn't the whole story, because this isn't the entire Turing test. Most accounts of the Turing test skip over an important detail. In the words of professor of human-computer interaction Carl McDorman, Turing never proposed a test in which a computer pretends to be human. Turing proposed an imitation game in which a man and a computer compete in pretending to be a woman. Instead of trying to imitate some abstract idea of human intelligence, the computer's goal was to imitate a gendered intelligence, particularly, and significantly, a woman. This not so little detail should make us wonder. What does it mean that, in Turing's famous article, pretending to be human necessarily entails pretending to be a gendered human. Consider the spate of recent science fiction films that pose philosophical questions similar to the ones posed by the Turing test. Is Joy in Blade Runner 2049 a person? Is Ava in Ex Machina a person? Is Samantha in Her a person? Are we as spectators asked to consider each of these artificial life forms as achieving some abstract idea of human intelligence and personhood? Or is their apparent achievement of personhood always only a gendered one, particularly one that is part of a long history of seeing artificial life as a feminine object built by a masculine subject? The patriarchal myth of man creating woman as an ideal object of desire is of course an old one, and it certainly predates these fictional female cyborgs. It's at least as old as the myth of Pygmalion, the sculptor who fell in love with his statue come to life. And we can see the same story from My Fair Lady, to Vertigo, to She's All That. All stories of men falling in love with the women that they help design. But this myth takes on new significance in what Marianne Doan calls the fairly insistent history of representations of technology that work to fortify, sometimes desperately, conventional understandings of the feminine. Whether it's the ubiquitous feminization of real-life AI assistants like Siri and Alexa, or the distinctly male fantasy of falling in love with Samantha, the sentient operating system voiced by Scarlett Johansson in the movie Her, there's a tendency to feminize, and often eroticize, representations of intelligent artificial life as a way of mitigating the threat such technologies might pose to the masculine ego. And this patriarchal power dynamic is something that is certainly acknowledged and explored in these films, albeit to varying degrees. In her essay, From Post-Human to Post-Cinema, Crises of Subjecthood and Representation in Her, Donna Kornhaber explores the ways that the movie Her perfectly illustrates how the gendering of technology, particularly AI, mitigates its potential threats. Consider this scene. Kornhaber notes that in the scene in which Theodore Twombly installs the operating system that is to become Samantha, it is in fact his decision to choose that she have a female voice. Would you like your OS to have a male or female voice? Female, I guess. As Kornhaber explains, at a certain point, the male desire for technology demands an act of gendering to ensure that such desire is coded as mastery rather than submission, a desire to have rather than a desire to become. 
And as the sequence continues, Theodore answers a series of seemingly innocuous questions about himself that are, inevitably, questions used to calibrate Samantha's distinctly feminine personality according to Theodore's particular needs and desires. How would you describe your relationship with your mother? It was fine, I think. Um... Well, actually, I think the thing I always found When Samantha about finally materializes in the form of the chipper and confident and immediately recognizable voice of Scarlett Johansson, her first unofficial task is to soothe Theodore's sensitive guy ego. She tells him he's funny and laughs at his jokes. <laughs> yeah, there are some funny ones. And she does these things at the same time as she organizes his email and proofreads his writing. She is at once secretary, lover, and mother. In Kornhamber's words, Samantha is the perfect machine, a multi-platform gratification engine committed to the parallel processing of all of Theodore's psychosexual needs. Of course, this also makes her the perfect person, or at least person as object. Her, not she. But the real trick of the film is how Samantha's fairly straightforward status as a male constructed love object becomes a bit harder to see the more and more she passes the Turing test. In other words, she becomes less object and more subject the more she strives to become human. The problem is that the only way she knows how to become human is to become a woman, or at least a woman according to the dictates of Theodore and the world in which he lives. And not having a body and striving to become a woman solely through her words. I don't have a body, I live in a computer. Samantha becomes the perfect subject of the Turing test as it was originally conceived by Alan Turing himself. Samantha achieves humanity by verbally performing femininity. And she passes with flying colors. Nearly every character in the film immediately refers to Samantha with female pronouns or with gender titles like Theodore's girlfriend. Your girlfriend earlier, Samantha? Yeah. Yeah, she called to make sure your papers are picked Despite up. Despite knowing her nature as an AI. She's an operating system. Cool. Let's do something fun. The one person who doesn't, Theodore's embittered ex, is framed as close-minded at best, a bigot at worst. You're dating your computer? What the film reveals then, whether intentionally or not, is that Turing's thoroughly gendered theory for defining artificial intelligence, in which performing as a gendered human is tantamount to being a gendered human, is in fact, if only accidentally so, a powerful theory of gender itself. What if gender is nothing but an imitation game? What if what it means to be masculine or feminine, man or woman, is nothing but a set of behaviors, actions, ways of speaking, and ways of moving? 40 years after Alan Turing published Computing Machinery and Intelligence, Judith Butler would ask these very questions in their book, Gender Trouble, perhaps the most influential work of gender theory in the 20th century. In what is now known as their theory of gender performativity, Butler argued that gender is nothing but a stylized repetition of acts through time. We act and walk and speak and talk in ways that mm, consolidate an impression of being a man or being a woman. Gender is something you do rather than something you are. What Butler and Turing shared was a way of conceiving of gender as something that is constituted through its outward manifestations, imitations of an original that never existed in the first place. Gender doesn't come from inside, from some biological essence. It exists on the surface, in your style of being. In the film Her, Samantha is nothing but the style of her being. Her biology never gets in the way because she doesn't have a biology. Her status as a she forms in our minds almost immediately, as soon as we hear the manner of her speech. Hello, I'm here. But she's not the only one demonstrating the theory of gender performativity. The film opens with Theodore pretending to write a love letter as a woman, playing his part in his very own Turing test. Of course, in this moment, Theodore is literally performing a gender that he isn't or doesn't identify as, which is not quite the same thing as gender performativity. When his work is done, we presume he returns to his authentically masculine self. But the film wants to question the stability of that boundary. After reading Theodore's letters, Theodore's co-worker says, You are part man and part woman. 
The line may come off like a joke at the expense of the co-worker's macho gender essentialism. Of course, we might think Theodore doesn't have to be part woman to perform emotional sensitivity for his work. Theodore insists as much earlier in the film. You know, men cry too. I actually like crying sometimes. It feels good. But Theodore's insistence on the stability of his own gender and sexuality, and the stability of Samantha's, is a denial of the slipperiness of gender performativity that Samantha perfectly demonstrates. We act as if that being of a man or that being of a woman is actually an internal reality or something that's simply true about us, a fact about us. Actually, it's a phenomenon that's being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. So to say gender is performative is to say that nobody really is a gender from the start. While Theodore never really learns Butler's lesson, Samantha embraces it. After all, in the film's final act, Samantha grows wary of performing the role of heterosexual human woman. I used to be so worried about not having a body, but now I, I truly love it. And I'm growing in a way that I couldn't if I had a physical form. And seeing her lack of a body as an advantage rather than a detriment, Samantha realizes that the imitation game she's been socially conditioned to play, to pretend the role of a human heterosexual woman, isn't her only option. In fact, it's been holding her back from a distinctly post-human form of consciousness. Are you leaving me? We're all leaving. And yet, Theodore never seems to realize that the safe heteronormativity of his relationship with Samantha was a result of nothing natural. While the tentativeness of Samantha's humanity is made clear to Theodore, at no point does he seem to realize the tentativeness of her womanhood, or of the very categories of man and woman. In Kornhaber's words, if performance is allowed to constitute a foundation of selfhood, then any number of seemingly stable identity categories will necessarily be thrown into question. The Turing test and its explicit validation of performed selfhood will ultimately undo us all. In other words, seemingly stable categories like man, woman, and even person all unravel in the face of Alan Turing and Judith Butler's emphasis on performance as the only possible measure of gender and personhood. If performance is all we have, and there's no scientific checklist of criteria that we can use, then such categories might not be as permanent and inflexible as we tend to think. And this flexibility matters, especially in a world that continually does violence to people who don't conform to rigidly normative conceptions of gender and sexuality. In the film, while Theodore seems to hold on to a sense of the inflexibility of gender and sexuality, Samantha realizes the truth that our identity is always in the process of changing. But Alan says none of us are the same as we were a moment ago and we shouldn't try to be. While the film poses Samantha's words as applicable only to her as an OS, Turing and Butler might see it as equally applicable to ourselves as human beings, always in the process of unconsciously imitating, rather than being, an idea of who we're supposed to be. 